You often get these wild booms and busts in, in frontier markets in, in Africa. And if you can find steady businesses that have sold off because of a, a macro perception of risk, uh, that's often an ideal time to enter into a market. That particular bank is only in Tanzania. And it's done so well that it's actually the most profitable bank in the whole of East Africa. Now, there are... If you look at the level of government bonds, interest rates are typically they range from the high single digits all the way through to, to the high teens. Yeah. Kenya has a fairly uh, interesting education system in that most people there go through school speaking English, even though it's not their native mm. language. I'm a strong believer in niche markets, especially when it comes to investing. As such, I was very much intrigued learning about Tim Starmose's African Lion Fund, a value-focused fund specialized in African countries. I couldn't resist inviting Tim to the accent to interview him about the countries and industries he invests in, his investment process, his most recent investments, and other things. But before we start, don't forget to subscribe. And now we start. Growing up, I always had this idea of Africa as a, like one poor country that needs uh, people's help. But eventually I realized it's, uh, it's very far from true. It's, uh, there are many different countries there and some countries are quite developed. When you invest in Africa, which countries do you typically focus on? So you ask about uh, the common perception of, of Africa uh, that a lot of us had growing up. And I, I think you're right. There's, there's a misconception, unfortunately, uh, for various reasons, media coverage. And yes, there were lots of unfortunate events during uh, our generation, famines in Ethiopia, you know, wars and things like this. But when you come to Africa nowadays and you see it firsthand on the ground, you you have a completely different view. There are obviously lots of different levels of development uh, between countries, poor ones, rich ones, medium uh, ones, and also within countries, there are wealthy areas, poor areas. But in general, things are improving as years go by. There's a very good book, actually, that I would recommend to anyone called Factfulness, which was written by a, a Swedish development uh, economist. or I think he was actually a, a medical doctor who worked in, in development. Mm called uh, Hans Rosling, from what I recall. But the book itself is called Factfulness. And it, it explains a lot of these things, uh, that this perception that people in Western Europe and, and the US have about Africa being you know, a destitute, poor place is not, not correct. Which uh, countries you primarily focus on? Yeah, so I, I came back to Tanzania where I was born. Uh, I, I left when I was young. I never really had a connection with the place growing up, but I, I came here in 2018 for a holiday and I realized that there was a stock market and it got me intrigued. Uh, there were a lot of interesting businesses. I'm a value investor at heart and things were quite cheap. And after I went back to, to Asia, where I had been living for the past uh, 25, 26 years, I did more research and I organized a second trip in late 2018, which was more of a business trip to come and go around with a broker to ma uh, visit companies and, and get a feel for the economy and the investment opportunities that were available. So that's how it started. Uh, I then began to invest my own capital in, in certain companies here in, in Tanzania. One of my favorite investments is the main cement supplier to the Dar es Salaam region, which is called Twiga Cement, a company that's sitting up here on the hill and very close to the, the biggest market in the country. And cement, of course, is very expensive to transport around. So I, I figured that it had a, a unique competitive advantage being situated right next to where most of the demand comes from and it being difficult for competitors to compete uh, if they have to ship their cement in from further away. So that, that was the genesis of, of the idea of managing money in Africa, basically. So it's, it's been about five years. So you primarily focus on Tanzania or you invest in other countries as well? Uh, yes. So uh, the fund that I run, uh, African Lions Fund is the name, it can invest in any frontier market in Africa, sub-Sahara. So mm -hmm. it doesn't do South Africa and it doesn't do the North African countries such as Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria. Uh, so it can invest anywhere uh, in Africa. It so happens that most of the money that I currently manage about, uh, I can get you an exact number actually, if I just look at my spreadsheets here, uh, we have about 54% of the capital in Tanzania, but it's not the only market that we focus on. Mm -hmm. We also have significant uh, positions in Kenya, 
uh, our neighbor here to the north, as well as in several other countries, uh, Rwanda, uh, Senegal. And then I've just come back from a trip to Nigeria, in fact, and we, we also have small positions in Nigeria, Ghana, Zambia. So it's quite spread around. Uh, but the bulk of the, the capital, as I say, over half of it at the moment is in uh, the Tanzanian market. So what's the criteria of you? Like, how did you choose these particular uh, countries? Is it based on the development stage or English language? A combination of things, which, which you touch on there. I'm more of a, a bottom-up value investor. So I'm willing to invest anywhere, whether it be Francophone Africa or ex-British Commonwealth countries or British Commonwealth countries here where you have English and common law, which is what I'm familiar with having grown up in Australia. But it's primarily a, uh, a question of where are there great companies selling at decent prices that I think are too low. Uh, and that led me in the first instance uh, here to Tanzania because there was a a perception that the previous government was anti-foreign investment and a lot of investors had uh, taken their money out. And mm. in actual fact, uh, companies at the time that I came, 2018, were already starting to do relatively well again. There had been a, a banking, uh, not quite a crisis, but certainly a, a cyclical downturn in the banking industry, which had caused a shock to the economy. So you often get these wild booms and busts in, in frontier markets in, in Africa. And if you can find steady businesses that have sold off because of a, a macro perception of risk, uh, that's often an ideal time to enter into a market. That's certainly uh, the main driver of, of my investment decision-making and, and country exposure. At the moment, I see a similar pattern in Kenya, Kenya has uh, a, a terrible macroeconomic environment at the moment and a lot of negative sentiment uh, around their debt position. They have an external debt position that's uh, a bit shaky. They need to pay back a euro bond in early June next year, about $3 billion. And there are people who think that they will struggle to come up with, with all of this money and maybe have to refinance at uh, punitive rates. You've seen similar... Credit crises happen in Ghana most recently, and then before that, Zambia. So the Kenyan government, I think, has taken the view that they never want to be in a situation like Ghana and Zambia where they actually do default because then it gets really painful. So what they seem to be doing, in my opinion, is taking pain up front in order to get the funds prepared to pay back this money. So they're taxing everything that moves and and really, you know, focusing on on raising revenues for this purpose. And it's hurting uh, the economy in the short term because of that. But if they get over that hump, then I would expect that sentiment improves. And then you perhaps get a revaluation of, of the stock market. So I've been looking at, uh, at Kenya more closely. We already have a lot of uh, investments there. Uh, but I'm I'm focused on switching some of our profitable positions else, elsewhere into the Kenyan market at the moment, uh, playing with the way it's playing out. So when you look at this fund, is it opportunistic short-term uh, play or it's a long-term play on the growth of Africa? I am a long-term investor and I do say to uh, potential investors in the fund that if they can't stick it out for at least five years, then it's probably not the right fit for them. However, within that, there are short-term opportunistic trading opportunities as these you know, volatile business conditions come and go. But what we're trying to do is to use sell-offs to accumulate positions for the long term. And if uh, you know, hopefully we get situations where everyone falls in love with certain uh, places in Africa and money pours in and things get too expensive, and then we'll be glad to sell uh, our positions if, if ever they get ahead of what I think they're truly worth. But it's very much a long-term strategy, and I say to people, five to 10 years uh, minimum, 15 years even, uh, I, I have two young uh, daughters, and I try and invest not for the way the world is today, but the way the world's going to be when, when they're out of high school and entering university. So that's, that's a 15-year horizon for me personally. So that's really the, the fit with the fund. And the, the driving force behind that is, is partly the thesis that I have that Africa's demographics are going to be very important for the way that the economies develop over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. 
you have a lot of children at the moment uh, that are getting their education and then will enter the workforce. So you're going to have a bulge in the working age population between now and 2050, even if you, if you take a slightly longer term view. And that's something that if you look at the economic development in Asia, the demographics were also very similar. 50 years ago, like way back in the 1970s, you put a, a population pyramid of Asia in the 1970s against Africa now, 50 years later, and they're almost identical. So the thesis is that you have more working age people and fewer young people dependent on them, and you don't yet have lots of retired or elderly people who are also dependent. So it's a, a lower dependency ratio and a, a much more uh, sizable workforce. In fact, Asia obviously has, has come ahead in leaps and bounds over the, the last 50 years, but now you're seeing the workforce shrink in places like China, especially also in Japan, Korea, Taiwan. Uh, Northeast Asia is, is in the aging population part of their development curve. So Africa, you know, it's not going to be exactly the same, and there are challenges for sure with education levels and capital to mobilize all this labor that's going to come into the labor force. But I think if you take a glass half full view, as I do, it's a tailwind for the economic development of, of the continent. Yeah, that was my question, actually. Like, demographics sounds like a, a great thesis. But if you have all these young people who are unemployed, how helpful is that? I like to say it's a, a glass half full or glass half empty view. So you have people like me saying, well, solutions will come. You know, the capital mm -hmm. from the wealth parts of the world is going to have to come and invest in Africa to employ these people or the, the people are going to get on boats and go across the Mediterranean like they are and it's just going to get even uh, you know more uh, severe and policymakers here really have to uh, address their side of the bargain they need, they need to be more consistent and more welcoming of foreign investment and get the capital in so that's that's uh, you know my view but yes there are others who say oh well, you have lots of unemployed youth and it's going to be a complete disaster and it's going to lead to chaos and, and even wars and things like that. Now, no one knows the answers, uh, but I'm, I'm an optimist uh, on these things rather than a pessimist. And it was the same in, in Asia in the early days. I think if you go back in time and look at things that were written about populations in places like China, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, you know, it's, it's always a negative perception for whatever mm -hmm. reason, but it's been proved wrong. Uh, so it can be done. Africa has a roadmap. They just need to get serious about implementing the right parts of that. Uh, that's my message also whenever I meet people in positions of influence. But ultimately, uh, you know, I'm not here to lecture anyone. It's it's their, uh, their right to manage their countries as they wish. Uh, but I think in the interest of prosperity and, and happiness for everyone, uh, they need to find a solution where they can attract more capital in to to employ all of these people. One of the ways that uh, Asia was able to prosper is to allow West outsource uh, labor to Asia. Is the same yeah. thing happening in uh, in Africa? Because I don't uh, not to the extent that it probably should be. There are challenges with education levels in certain places not being of the standard that they need to be for that to work. Uh, there's also the issue that, I mean, Asia is still competing in a lot of these low cost export industries that they, you know, they've shifted from China to places like Vietnam, Cambodia, Bangladesh. But there, there's a value chain and, and there are places. What I think um, is perhaps more promising in Africa is import substitution. So Africa imports a lot of products from Asia, China, and other places like that that could actually be made. Instead of shipping the resources that come from Africa to China and then importing them back again as manufactured goods, uh, Nigeria in particular, where I've just been this week, is a country where that's a, a big problem. Africa's largest uh, oil producer uh, maybe not right now because they've had problems in their oil industry, but it certainly has a potential to be, again, the number one producer in Africa. But they they import refined petroleum. It, it makes no sense. So, you know, you're an oil producer, but you import <laughs> the gas to, to run your cars. And you get that in other industries as well. 
So there is a, a push in Eastern Africa here to be a critical supplier of materials for the whole uh, electric vehicle revolution. You know, a lot of the minerals that are required to go into batteries for electric cars and to make the cars themselves are found here in in Eastern Africa and Central Africa, Congo, Zambia, uh, places like that. So there's there's a push to create a value chain where things are not just dug up and shipped out, but actually that some of the value addition takes place here. So these are the things that I think have the potential to employ people uh, in the longer run if they get it right. Mm -hmm. Now, there are obviously challenges there such as infrastructure. You know, the first step is to put in uh, infrastructure. Then you need the capital to build the factories before you can employ the people. So it's a long-term process. But I think the, the development development model that Asia had is perhaps not quite the right fit uh, for Africa. You also have saturation in, in places like the US where people have bought so much stuff <laughs> that do they really need more <laughs> manufactured knickknacks? It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Uh, but yeah, to answer the question, slightly different for Africa in my opinion. What are the leading industries right there and which ones you typically focus on? So it depends on, on the countries. Obviously, some countries are mineral rich. Others are strong in agriculture. For the countries that I follow closely, Tanzania has a large gold mining industry. It's also big in tourism. Uh, I think four of the top five tourist destinations in Africa are, are here in, in Tanzania. Uh, so they earn a lot of foreign currency from tourism exports. They also have significant uh, agricultural production, and those are sort of the three pillars of, of the Tanzanian economy in terms of exports. I, I like to say it's like a three-legged stool, so as long as two of those are, are doing well, nothing topples over. Uh, other countries nearby, Uganda is uh, very strong in, in agricultural produce, coffee and, and things like that. Kenya does tea, avocados. Kenya is an interesting place in that there's also a nascent services export industry. Uh, for example, in IT, uh, a lot of companies outsource coding and, and moderation of social media feeds and things to, to Kenya. Kenya has a fairly uh, interesting education system in that most people there go through school speaking English, even though it's not their native mm -hmm. language. So it's a bit like uh, the Philippines or India, where English is used as a medium of education. And you see uh, the potential for companies to use uh, that labor pool uh, for outsourcing of services, also call centers and things yeah. like that. So there's a mix of, of industries. It's not all digging up stuff out of the ground and shipping it to China, although that's, that's the prevalent uh, export industry in places like Zambia and the De Democratic Republic of Congo. They're driven you know, primarily by mining Oil, obviously, is also a big thing. And over in West Africa, we, we do have investments uh, also in Gabon, believe it or not, the, the country that recently suffered a coup. Uh, that, that's a country where oil is the major industry, uh, Nigeria, Angola. We, we can't invest in Angola, unfortunately, because there's no stock market that functions. But it's, uh, it's very much a mixed bag. There is manufacturing, but not as much as there should be, uh, in my opinion. You, know, you need more investors to come in and, and build factories uh, for that to take off. When you look at the high-level valuations, what's the difference between, let's say, U.S. and average African company? Like in U.S., like what, what, what is S&P is probably trading with it? 1720 typically yeah in, it, in the high it? teens i think you're, you're you're right there here valuations are much lower you can find high quality businesses that trade on on decent valuations and that's what attracted me here in the first place but to give you an idea i actually updated the the uh, model for my portfolio a couple of weeks ago it's trading on a indicative pe of about 6.2 uh, mm. for 2024 so you can see that it's it's quite attractive relative to developed markets. Now, of course, there are also higher risks in Africa. Mm -hmm. So a discount is definitely warranted. But my view is that you get paid above and beyond uh, what that risk uh, should be paying you. You get overpaid for taking that risk. And if you select businesses carefully, uh, which I like to think that we do, you can actually buy things that are quite defensive mm -hmm. and aren't necessarily exposed to the wild fluctuations uh, that, that can occur. So what I focus on is 
returns on invested capital and returns on invested capital generally higher in Africa because you do have to stick on a lot of operational risk, uh, political risk, macro risk. Uh, so in order for capital to get attracted into viable business projects and not just sit in you know, treasury bills and bonds, there has to be an adequate return to entice uh, entrepreneurs to, to use their capital for other things. If you look at the level of government bonds, interest rates are typically, they range from the high single digits all the way through to, to the high teens in, in countries that are, are doing okay economically. So you, you can see that if you want to take on ec- extra risk to invest in active business ventures and equities, you really need to be shooting for 20% plus. And that's kind of the, the framework that I bring to the problem. Yeah. And P of roughly six. P of about 6.2. Yeah. You're a value investor, right? Like, and yeah. this six P of six on, uh, for more of the, Buffett type of investment or more like Grams? Uh, I am more of a Buffett style investor here in Africa. I used to do a lot of deep value activism stuff when I was in Asia and, and Australia. But here in Africa, I'm really trying to buy a high quality business at a reasonable price and then let the management compound the money for me instead of my efforts having to <laughs> find undervalued investments, wait for them to re-rate and then sell and then repeat the process. That's a, a tiring way to invest. It's it's a way that you can be very successful uh, if if you have the the interest and the stamina for it. Uh, but yeah, I'm more focused on buying what in the U.S. Uh, would sell on much higher multiples. You know, mm-hmm. consumer defensive stocks and things like this that uh, trade at uh, low valuations is really what attracts me here. That's a flavor of it. Six times sounds like very cheap for us if it is for like a really good business. What's your investment process like? Like, what's how do you find the ideas? As I explained, uh, I invest in sub-Saharan Africa frontier markets. Uh, so that in, immediately narrows my my universe down to, I think it's about seventeen of those countries that have active stock markets. Uh, so there are several uh, websites that track pricing and company announcements. And there are a couple of those that I use uh, as a starting point. I also uh, subscribe to various financial uh, screening tools. Uh, there's a decent one that I use called Finbox. Uh, there's one Ticker, uh, which is sort of a, a very similar thing done done differently. And there's another one trying to be a new Bloomberg called Coifin. I don't know whether your listeners are familiar with those three, but you don't have to pay for a Bloomberg terminal in this day and age. A lot of people have become addicted to Bloomberg terminals who come out of the professional money management industry. But I will, I am allowed to invest for various metrics, and then I will narrow it down and get a list. And then once I have a, a short list of you know, 80 to 100 companies, then it's time to go down and, and do a deep dive, firstly, on, on the macro uh, conditions in the country. I have this process that I call the eight M's. That there are things that uh, I look at, and macro is the first one. If a country doesn't have suitable macro conditions for us to invest in, then we immediately eliminate it. So Nigeria, until earlier this year, was in the category of not a place where I would invest because of certain problems with their foreign exchange uh, mechanism, uh, which you know, we can get into detail if, if you wish. But I would put Zimbabwe at the moment in that category because it's just too difficult uh, to manage the hyperinflation and devaluation of, of the Zimbabwean dollar there. So there are a lot of uh, decent businesses in Zimbabwe that are run by very competent people, but the macro environment is just too crazy uh, for, for me when I have choices to be somewhere more stable that's you know the the first filter so one of the important screens uh, in my process is the management and i think that's the case for a lot of investors that you want the company run by people who are not only competent but also honest and ethical in, in what they do so that's an important screen gotcha and what happens next so you you you, you found the company you kind of interested in how do you start digging into the financials? I will look at historically published primary source information. So by that, I mean, I'm not going to go and read a, an analyst report or a magazine article about the company. I'm going to look at what the company itself has published, the information that they released to the stock exchange, 
their website, their advertising materials, uh, interviews with management where you can hear what they said firsthand. And then if I'm comfortable with with the financials and and it passes my other screens, then I'll start uh, perhaps trying to set up a meeting with the management or dialing into an investor earnings call and, and asking the questions that I still have. And during COVID, a lot of that part of the process of meeting people face to face was was not possible, but mm-hmm. you did it in a way like we're doing now. And it, it, it was a decent substitute and it allowed me to start the fund, even though we were under these very strange conditions where I couldn't hop on a plane to Nigeria and sit down with the managing director of a company like I do now. Uh, but that is also part of my process for screening companies and, and getting comfortable with finally pulling the trigger and making an investment. I, I like to meet the management or, or at least speak to them uh, in, in an online forum. How receptive are they to the meeting? It varies a lot. Generally, you can get access to at least some people within the management. It's possible to get brokers to help you do that. Uh, if you reach out directly, sometimes that also works, but it's a mixed bag. There are a few companies that just don't speak to investors, but I'll tend to shy away from that. I mean, if, if they don't even want to talk to minority investors, then that's, that's a red flag in a way. But I, I have pretty good relationships with the management of, of the biggest positions that we have here in, in Tanzania. And, you know, I've met the CEO of all of those companies. Uh, I, I regularly communicate with, uh, other people in the management team for most of them so it's possible and that's part of the work that that i'm doing for my investors if, if you look at it that way how do you value security do you use like pe do you use EBITDA? i don't have any one particular magic number that i use but the closest thing to it i want a company that generates a high return on invested capital so Ideally, it doesn't have a lot of debt. I, I shy away from companies that have a lot of debt, but if it has a bit of debt, you know that that may still be okay. But I'm looking for a return on equity. If they're not, say they're debt free, so you're only looking at equity. Mm-hmm. I want a return on equity that's at least fifteen percent and above, ideally higher. And then I'm looking to buy that equity at a multiple of one times book if it's fifteen. Mm-hmm. If it's thirty. I want to pay no more than two times book. Mm-hmm, I see. If it's uh, if it's ten in a rare situation where I might consider a company that has a current return on equity of only ten percent because I think it's going to get better, then I want to buy it below book value. If you see what I mean, that's that's the the closest thing to a magic formula. It's just it's just a back of the envelope calculation that I do to get me interested in something. So if a company has a uh, a 75% return on equity, uh, which some good businesses can, but it's selling for 20 times book value, then it's too expensive for me. That's mm-hmm. that's where the value element comes in. Although there are other people that just buy these fantastic businesses at, at any price and then let them run. I still have the value investor uh, inside me that avoids me from <laughs> from taking the plunge on some of these very expensive things. I use your approach for banks. I do the same thing, but do you use it across industries? Uh, it's difficult in in some industries where you know the assets are intangible and and you have a, a book that looks very low. So it, it does depend, but I'll try and adjust for that if if the situation arises. But I I do tend to apply it across uh, industries. It it works also for manufacturers, I find. Where it's uh, let's say intangible, you know, if if you're valuing uh, or, or where the assets, as they used to say in investment bankings, the assets go up and down in the elevators. You know, it's the people, and they're not on the balance sheet. So it depends on on which industry. But you're right, banks for sure is is a one where you can uh, use a lot of ratios and formulas across because the the banking industry is so similar. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, a bank is a bank. How's banking industries? in African countries you invest in? Because it's I, I've heard quite a bit about Nigeria, but what about the others? Yes, yeah, so banking is surprisingly uh, very profitable in most of these markets. It's a much simpler business than in developed markets. They, they tend to have a lot of government securities that pay 
you know, reasonably high yields. In a way, uh, you can view it as a leveraged way of getting government bond exposure. Hmm. Companies, uh, or sorry, banks here in, in East Africa might have 20, 25% of their assets in government securities at a minimum going, you know, all the way up to 50% for certain banks. It's a bit simpler than, than in developed markets. There's not a, a big mortgage industry because there are problems with land titles in most countries. So it, it's just not developed in, in the same way. Uh, there's also a lot of retail lending that gets done by banks in, in this area. So instead of people having a credit card where they charge all their expenses to and then ideally pay off <laughs> at the end of the month, although not everyone does that, the uh, credit card industry here is not very developed. So what you see is that people who have a steady salaried job where they can show the bank that they're a good credit risk, they will borrow against that salary and they will get a what's called a salary loan that they then use to uh, have some credit uh, for expenses. That's a very popular uh, banking product here in, in East Africa, also in Southern Africa. I remember I was in Namibia earlier in the year and it's it's very big there. But the banks are not as large and complex as they are in most developed markets. You can more easily understand the balance sheets. Where uh, banks do seem to get into disproportionate uh, numbers of problems is when they make large corporate loans. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen that time and again where the banking cycle gets going. Uh, they initially are quite defensive making these retail loans and putting their money in government securities. But then when that gets saturated, you know, they start lending to big businesses for expansion projects and it can get messy when when they make the wrong decisions. It's certainly a big part of the listed uh, equity space. Banks are, are dominant in a lot of markets uh, in in frontier Africa, so it is a an industry that I look at quite frequently. How, how do you size the positions when you decide to pull the trigger on the acquiring company? Yes, position sizing is is something that's very. Uh, tricky. <laughs> I do not have a formulaic approach. I know there are guys that will have a rule where they want to own 20 great businesses and they put 5% in each. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer that you put more money in your best ideas and less money in your uh, perhaps not so high conviction ideas. So that's a starting point for me. I'm not shy to take a big position in in my best ideas. However, there's also liquidity constraints in, in these markets. So you, you find that you have to be opportunistic. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you one example. There's a, a very high quality brewing and soft drinks business listed in Rwanda. It's a subsidiary of Heineken. So if you recall our conversation about what kind of company uh, and who the other shareholders are, you have Heineken as an 80% shareholder and then 20% is owned by minorities. So essentially Heineken runs the business for you and they want to get paid their dividends. So all of the, the money they make gets paid out to head office in Holland or to the minorities here on the ground. Anyhow, it's a very tightly held company because of that small free float and the fact that it also completely dominates the beer business and also the Coca-Cola uh, bottling uh, franchises with them in Rwanda. So they, they dominate beverages uh, across the entire economy. So as you can imagine, once someone has made up their mind to own that, they tend to keep hold of it. So not not often does it trade. But I then had to decide, well, I'd love to have 10, 15% of the fund in this, but not that much stock is available. So I just take whatever is available. And then if an opportunity comes along later to buy a block of shares to increase that position weighting, then I will look at my other investments and decide to sell something in order to fund the purchase of that. So it ends up being that we do have a fairly top-heavy portfolio because I want to put lots of money in my best ideas. And if the, those ideas are, are working, then it gets to the point where they become even more outsized because they'll go up more than the rest. That's how I, I think about it. But by the same token, I don't want to have lots of small positions. So my fund mandate uh, is to own between 10 and 20 good businesses uh, at decent valuations here. Hmm. And I think at the moment we have 17 positions. Uh, we could take it up a little bit. But I, I need something that 
also is, is big enough to move the needle. You know, there's no point in me having half of one percent in, in a position where it has to you know go up tenfold to make a, a meaningful impact on the portfolio. So that's that's how I think about that. There's no hard and fast rules. And it's more of an art than a science uh, in our case. It's obviously fairly concentrated based on the U.S. standards at least. Do you hedge? Yes. And I'm talking about hedging the getting put options or whatever. And do you hedge currencies? Uh, the short answer is no, because these markets are just not developed enough. Uh, there are mm -hmm. very few markets where there are even any derivatives available. Uh, and if you want to do structured products, it gets very expensive. So... We do not hedge uh, at this point, uh, not because I'm fundamentally opposed to the idea. You know, if there was a cost-effective way of hedging currency risk, I would certainly uh, be very interested in that. You know, if there are people watching or listening to this who are in that space, uh, you know, please come to Africa and use your expertise to, to <laughs> set up uh, derivatives and, and these possibilities for us. But at the moment, no, we don't have that opportunity unfortunately you mentioned in the beginning that about half of your fund is in tanzania do you yeah. diversify based on geography or you like you don't care how many of these 17 or 20 businesses are in one country i do have an allocation cap of 50 percent to any one country based on entry price so our tanzanian positions have gone above 50 because they've done well mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's the one rule that I, I do try and, and follow because it is important to have some ge geographic diversification. You know, if you set up a one country fund, you're very vulnerable to something going wrong in, in that country. But yes, it, the, the 20, 10 to 20 stocks that we want to own, if eight of them were in one country, 10 of them were in one country, it, it wouldn't bother me. I'm really focused on, on the business rather than, you know, the portfolio. At what point would you consider trimming your largest position let's say your top position uh becomes 25 percent of your fund does it bother you or you let it continue running i would let it run uh in most circumstances we've actually had this issue uh, in recent months so the biggest position that we have in the fund is uh, a very well managed conservative bank in tanzania called nmb bank with one of its competitors the two of them you know, they have the lion's share of the banking industry and they go neck to neck. But it had become well over 20% of, of our portfolio. Now, in itself, that didn't bother me because I'm still comfortable with the valuation. I'm still comfortable with the company's prospects and the management. But I had an even better opportunity to buy something else at a much lower valuation uh, elsewhere. So I decided to take a small part of the NMB position off the table take the profit and then reallocate the money. So yeah, I am balancing. But if I didn't have, you know, this other place to put the money that was a, a screaming buy, then I would have been comfortable to let it let it run. Was it the reason why you didn't sell NB and uh buy that other position? Well, that comes back to having some diversification. It's not always possible due to liquidity reasons either to sell everything at once and then get your foreign currency and move it to one of the other markets. So there are a lot of moving parts uh, to these decisions. It's it's not like being in a, a big developed liquid market where, you know, the portfolio theory can also be implemented in practice. You, you mm -hmm. have to look at uh, whether there are constraints on on implementing uh, the decisions before you, you, you pull the trigger. What happens with taxation on, on the profits? Is it based on where your investors are located or? Something else. Yes. So obviously, there are a lot of taxes uh, that the businesses pay locally in the economies. Uh, a lot of the companies that we own are the biggest taxpayers in the countries where they operate. For example, the brewer here in Tanzania is by far the biggest taxpayer in the country. So the companies pay tax. And then if we get paid a dividend for the fund, there's a withholding tax. It varies from 5% here in Tanzania all the way up to, I think, 17.5% in, in one of the other countries. So the fund pays that withholding tax in the case where we earn a dividend. But the fund is structured in a tax-neutral jurisdiction, uh, which means that people from all over the world can invest in the fund and then mm -hmm. they get their investment return free of any tax at the fund level. 
and they will then declare the tax at their own resident or you know tax jurisdiction. So if you're resident in a place like Hong Kong, like I used to be, where investment gains are not taxed, then that will just flow through and you won't owe anyone any further tax than the dividend withholdings. If you're uh, in, in California, I believe, such as yourself, then it's yeah. uh, quite different. <laughs> Although it's a lovely place to be, the taxes are rather high. Walk me through your largest position. You mentioned it's A&B a and B Bank. How is it? N- NMB, yeah. So that that's the largest position that we have uh, currently. As I said, it's uh, it's a very simple uh, business to understand. A bit of history also, maybe. It was a bank that was initially managed by Rabobank from the Netherlands. They came into Tanzania, I think, in the early 1990s. And it was, uh, at that point, a, a microfinance institution. NMB actually stands for National Microfinance Bank, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but they, they pivoted it to be a, a full uh, universal bank here. And they've grown it quite impressively. And then at some point, five years ago, I think the Rabobank sold out of the investment and no longer had the management uh, contract and their stake went into a foundation. So you have a, a situation where the Tanzanian government, the foundation that was ceded by Rabobank and also the Netherlands and, and Norwegian governments, if I'm not mistaken, they're kind of equal shareholders in the low 30s and then about... 32, 33% of the, the bank is traded on, on the stock exchange. The main part of NMB's business is what I was talking about before. It's these salary loans. Mm-hmm. So they will go to government departments or big corporations and propose that they make loans to the salaried individuals there. It's a very low credit risk because the way it's set up is that they actually get paid before the person gets their salary. So if you've borrowed money against your salary, it's automatically taken out and paid back to NMB, whatever you owe them each month, and then you get your salary. So that's one big business that they have. They also obviously do corporate lending and they invest in government securities and so on. But it's a very well-capitalized bank uh, and the leverage is not not great. Um, I mean, not excessive. And the management team is conservative. The cost to income ratio is lower than any of the other banks in this market. So there are a lot of metrics where they lead. It was really a, an easy decision to, to get a large exposure to this bank. Mind you, it wasn't easy because it's a bit like the brewer in Rwanda that I was talking about. It's so good that a lot of people don't want to sell their shares. Mm. <laughs> so it, it required some, uh, some patience and uh, knowledge of the, the landscape here. Like I, I, had some history with a company that owned a, a big stake in NMB and I knew that they had this shareholding. And then when they started to sell a few, I was able to buy all the funds from them. What's a rough leverage of that bank? So the loan to deposit ratio is in the 70s. Uh, so, I mean, where I grew up in Australia, a lot of banks are above 100. Yeah. <laughs> um, and capital adequacy ratio is in the 20% range. So they have a lot of equity and, and not a lot of borrowings. Most of it is deposit funded. They do issue the occasional bond, but if if the loan to deposit ratio is is that low, then there's no real need to uh, to be out there raising debt. When you look at the management of this bank, what was attractive? Is it because it was run by a rubber bank initially? That obviously helped. So they they instituted a, a certain culture, I think, in the bank. But all of the top management are local people now, and they were people who have been in the bank for a long time and got to know the systems and and come up through the ranks. Uh, That's something that attracts me. The CEO is a a local Tanzanian lady, Ruth Saipuna, who who also worked for Standard Chartered back in history. And, um, you know, she came from the CFO role into the managing director's uh, position. So she she has a long history of being in the bank and uh, there's a strong team around her. But definitely the the culture of the bank that Rabobank established is definitely something that made uh, a difference. And what drives the growth of the stock? Is it the multiple expansion or the, or the bank is expanding to other countries? That particular bank is only in Tanzania. And it's done so well that it's actually the most profitable bank in the whole of East Africa. Now, there are banks that are many, many times bigger, 
in Kenya who have expanded into regional markets. So they, their core business is still Kenya, but they've gone into Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, uh, DRC. So this is a bit of an unusual situation at the moment. But they they feel that there's enough untapped demand here in Tanzania that they don't really need to focus on expanding yet. There has been some talk of looking at uh, the Congo. Uh, a lot of the banks have gone in there and found that it's it's an attractive market. But basically, the level of financial inclusion here, or if you look at the bank population, it's only something like uh, two out of 10 people that even have a bank oh. account. Wow. in the country so there's a lot of uh, <laughs> there's wow. a lot of room yeah. to grow uh, here but in terms of why the the stock price has done so well there's been a, a modest amount of multiple expansion i think it trades now on about four and a half times earnings versus say three and a half uh, when i first got in yeah, exactly it's cheap <laughs> but the main reason it's done so well is uh, compound earnings growth you know, the earnings that have, have been growing at uh, almost 30% a year for the last three years is it, quite incredible. Uh, but I always get nervous when banks grow too quickly, you know? Yes. <laughs> you I need to keep a close eye that they don't uh, start to loosen their, their lending policies and, and just watch it closely. I'm that's, guessing that's, that what... that's not the market where management has to think about share buybacks, right? They primarily... Uh, return capital through dividends. And how's the dividends in that bank in general? Yes. So there are very few companies that have done share buybacks. Uh, there is a case for a share buy, buyback in a handful of names that I look at in my you know 80 to 100 company universe, but not, not in the case of these companies here in Tanzania. In terms of the dividend policy that NMB specifically has, it pays out between 30 and 35% of earnings, so about a third. Uh, they pay out as dividend as the rest, and the rest they uh, reinvest. And to give a flavor of the yield this year, I expect the dividend to be 350, say, and the stock price now has gone all the way up to 4,700. So it's it's not a a huge dividend yield, but that's a function of the the low payout ratio. What is it? But there are other percent? stocks. There are other stocks I own where they pay out more. For example, uh, the cement company Twiga Cement, which I mentioned, uh, I think way back at the beginning of our conversation, they pay out more like eighty percent of their earnings. And on that one, uh, we have a nine percent plus uh, dividend yield expectation for this year. But there are stocks in our portfolio that yield as much as fourteen uh, percent in in Kenya. Uh, so dividends are also a big part of the equation. If you want to think about it as a hard currency, what do you think it would be? Return, um, dividend, everything? The fund that I'm running has compounded at about 13.5% in US dollar terms for the three years that we have been going. Mm-hmm. So it's up about 46% in three years. If you translate that into a compound annual growth rate, it's about 13.5%. So obviously, these currencies depreciate uh, historically by several percentage points a year when when you mm-hmm. model it. But it tends to be that they, they're fairly steady for a long period of time, and then there will be a devaluation, and then they'll be steady again. And uh, so it, it goes like that. It's, not a, it's mm-hmm. a bit choppy. But the way I think about it is that I'm aiming to double my investors' money every five years. So if I, if I want to do that in U.S. dollar terms, I've got to compound at what is 15. it, 14 seven almost 15 percent yeah let's say 15 percent to do that i probably need more like 18 19 20 percent in local currency terms so that that's how i think about it what was your most recent investment so the most recent investment we made is also a bank <laughs> and that was actually one of the ones uh, i was describing actually there there are two uh, that I reallocated part of our NMB profits to because I felt that they were a better value at this point in the cycle. Uh, there's a Kenyan bank. Again, it's the dominant bank along with one other competitor. Two banks in, in Kenya are much larger than the rest. The one that we bought is KCB. And the other large competitor that they have is Equity Bank. Now, KCB is a bank that has problems. They have significant legacy non-performing loans because they were essentially forced into a merger with a government-owned bank that had a lot of corporate loans that had gone bad. So they've been trying to clean that all up. However, it's it's a dominant franchise. 
It's in all of the East African markets. And there's a new CEO in there. Well, he's not that new. He's, he's been there longer than a year. Uh, but we had him on the phone explaining you know, how he sees the situation e- evolving and how he can clean it up and so on. And it had fallen to a valuation of one and a half times PE and about 0.2 times book value. So I thought, you know, even if they have problems, this thing is dominant franchise. It's certainly going to be around long after I'm gone. And they're addressing their issues. The macroeconomic environment in Kenya, as I described earlier, is very challenging. And that's what had caused a lot of people basically to just panic sell and dump this bank. It's gone all the way from 40-something Kenyan shillings down to, I think, the low was 15. Uh, we were able to pick some up in, in the, uh, the teens, uh, I think 17 and a half. But on that valuation of one and a half times earnings and 0.2, 0.3 times book, depending on how many of these bad loans you write off, uh, it looked too good to pass up. Uh, and that, that was why I shifted some money there. Do you tend to double down when the price goes down? Yeah, I'm not shy about that. I, I have a long history in investment markets, and I know that you're not going to pick the bottom. You just have to be comfortable that what you're buying has a significant margin of safety already. And then the other one, if, if I can mention another one that I also reallocated some money to is a company called Safaricom in Kenya, which is the dominant mobile phone company there. But it's also most famous for being in mobile money. It was the company that really made mobile money a big thing. Uh, in, in Africa and the world really is the world leader in that. And again, that stock has fallen from 44 all the way down to be trading at 13 and a half. The low a couple of weeks ago was only 12 something. But I've been buying it all the way. You know, I bought some at 15, I bought some at 1390, I bought some at 1350. It doesn't bother me to average down when I feel that I am already getting value. That's my style. There are other people who will wait for it to bottom and then start to trend up. And they don't mind missing the first 20, 30% of the uptrend. Good in theory, but I think in, in these markets where there's not a lot of liquidity, you really need to be prepared to buy when someone else is panic selling so that you can pick up significant amounts of stock. That's been my experience anyway. So both approaches are valid, but I'm not shy to be, to be buying lower and lower. When do you sell? That's the more difficult bit. <laughs> I've discussed with you the scenario where something has done really well. There's something else that I can find on a lower valuation. That's a a cause of of selling. Obviously, if something has gone too far in the other direction and the valuation has become crazy high, then I will also sell. Safaricom at 44, the valuation was ridiculous. I didn't own it because I I wasn't interested in, in buying it at those valuations. But had I... Had I been a holder at that time, I would like to think that I would have been sensible enough to sell because the valuation was too high. It's a portfolio allocation driven decision as well as a valuation driven decision. So you don't believe in uh, Biden holding forever? There are probably some businesses where you can do that. But when you're managing a portfolio, there's always going to be a restriction on the amount of capital that you have. Mm -hmm. And other opportunities are going to come along. So you're always going to have to rebalance to some extent, I think. Uh, For an individual investor, buying and holding a great business forever is probably quite a sensible thing to do. And then, you know, the other thing that we probably should address is you also have to know when to sell when you've made a mistake. And that that's also not an easy thing. So I have had a couple of investments since I started the fund where we had a position, admittedly not a large position, But then I became uncomfortable with management. You know, something changed or maybe I hadn't evaluated properly. So I sold out of a company in Kenya called Kenya Reinsurance, which is dominated by the government. The government owns uh, the biggest shareholding. And I just found that it was very difficult to get the board to even look at sensible suggestions uh, that some of us as shareholders have made. Uh, Another one... Different scenario, uh, small positions as the fund grew, 
I had to get rid of some positions that were just too small to move the needle, as I alluded to before. And then when the fund was smaller, being invested in small cap stocks was was not a, a barrier. But the Dar es Salaam Stock Exchange here in Tanzania, it's actually listed itself. And it's a small cap stock. And we got to the point where we owned uh, 5% of it. And I wasn't really comfortable owning that much of one company as a, as a fund manager. And then there were also some management issues that, that made me uh, have second thoughts. So we, we do exit things for, for those reasons as well, where perhaps they're no longer meeting the criteria that we set for ourselves when we first uh, did our screens and, and process that we put these things through. Most of the stocks that you invest in, they only trade it locally, right? They not don't have AGRs or anything. That's a problem, actually, because I, I know a lot of people are far more comfortable if they can just go into their own local uh, account and, and click on the button and, and buy the stock. So exactly, there are very few African listed companies that also can be accessed in uh, developed markets. There are a few. Um, one company, Airtel Africa, which is uh, a telecommunications company that operates around Africa, originally seeded and set up by Bharti uh, Airtel from India. Mm -hmm. It has a London stock exchange listing that you can access, and it's also listed in Nigeria. Uh, there's a Nigeria. Nigerian oil and gas producer called SEPA, same situation, listed both in London and in uh, Nigeria. And then there are some oil and gas companies that, that list in Europe. Some of the companies operating in Gabon, for example, are listed in Paris. So you can find small pockets where it's possible to access African businesses on developed markets, but it's, it's quite rare. ADRs, not really a thing. For example, I, w I would have thought that Safaricom uh, would have had a case to have an ADR back in uh, the boom times there when they were really uh, coming up the curve with their mobile money. Everyone wanted a piece of it, but it's a bit of a hassle to open an account in, in Nairobi and invest uh, sending your money to Kenya. can be done, though. It's it's not as difficult as, as people think. You know, don't be afraid if, if you're... A budding Jim Rogers, you know, you can you can certainly set up uh, local accounts like he did everywhere. Uh, even in this day and age, with all the compliance restrictions and so on, uh, it can be done. That's the way I would actually advise people who are serious about investing in these markets go about doing it. But there are things such as Airtel Africa, which trade fairly easily accessible in, in London. Well, Tim, thanks very much for, for the interview. It's uh, super helpful.